A partir de agora, daremos início à nossa primeira atividade. E para mediar a mesa redonda Blended Learning from Design to Evaluation, convidamos o professor titular do Departamento de Práticas de Saúde Pública da Faculdade de Saúde Pública da Universidade de São Paulo, o professor doutor Oswaldo Tanaka. Oswaldo Tanaka é médico, possui mestrado e doutorado em saúde pública pela Universidade de São Paulo. Atualmente é coordenador do Grupo de Trabalho de Avaliação da Associação Brasileira de Saúde Coletiva, Abrasco. Possui projetos de pesquisa no campo da avaliação de política e gestão em saúde, com especial interesse na integralidade da atenção em saúde em municípios de grande porte. Gostaríamos de informar que, durante a mesa redonda, receberemos perguntas dos ouvintes. Aos interessados, pedimos que solicitem um rascunho para a nossa equipe. Agora, passamos a palavra para o professor Oswaldo Tanaka, que irá mediar a mesa redonda. Bom dia a todos e todas. É um prazer imenso a gente poder estar aqui compartilhando esse momento. É com prazer que convidamos o professor Norman Vaughan, da Universidade Mount Royal, de Calgary, Alberta, do Canadá. Por favor, professor. <risos> professor Norman Vaughan é docente do Departamento de Educação é, da Universidade Mount Royal. Ele é um dos coautores de importantes livros que trabalham o ambiente de aprendizado é, amalgamado ou blended, que faz parte desta sua apresentação, criando comunidades de ensino-aprendizado com capacidade de sustentabilidade. Ele é também um dos cofundadores é, da Blended Online Design Network. Ele também faz parte do grupo de, de comunidade que trabalha essa pesquisa do ponto de vista internacional e também é um diretor associado de vários jornais que trabalham nesta área, tanto do ponto de vista acadêmico no Canadá, como também internacional. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Uh, this is a real privilege. Um, as you probably know, it's winter right now in Canada, so I came from snow, so just to come to this beautiful area. Also, it's a really privilege. I think you all know you have an incredibly rich history of um, open education, um, distance and online learning, and I'm really excited to learn from you. The other thing that was interesting, I picked up a little in the different keynotes, and there's something about the passion of Brazilian people. And just a message from our health professionals in Canada, because we are going to be talking a lot about technology, um, but at our university we have a saying, the more, oh, the more technology around us, the more the need for the human touch, and I think that's something we really shouldn't forget especially in the health professions. This is all about people helping people. So what I'd like to do is um, over the next, um, well, we'll see how long it takes. Um, I won't be too long, but really go over four different issues for you. The most important issue, I think, is this issue of student engagement, and want to talk to you about that. Um, all kinds of different discussions and debates about uh, blended learning. So I'd like to talk to you about that. But last but not least, and I know this is something that you're focused on, is just the role of the professor or the professora. What is our role in this, is this ever-changing environment? And that's where I'd really like to spend most of the time today. So to begin, just a little bit of a background about where I'm from, and I'd really invite any of you, if you ever want to come to Canada, just email me and, and, and we'll make it happen. Um, so to begin, um, I think you know where you are. You're a, I, I can't believe it, 220 million people. Just how many people live? Um, our country is maybe a little slightly larger than you in terms of size, but we only have, I don't even think it's 40 million people. And it's fascinating. Um, I think it's 80% of our population lives within 500 kilometers of the American border. So this is why open and distance and online learning is so important to us is the majority of our population is very dispersed. And with global warming, it's becoming a real national security issue. Um, 
that northern ice is not there anymore. Um, there's shipping actively taking place now between Europe and Asia going north of Canada. So it's a, a real issue for us and it's a real issue for the population that's there. So I live in a very controversial part of Canada and I think you may know where I live. So I live, let's see if we can get this to work. You yes. Like to be there. Oh, no, no, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> This is, I live in Alberta, so if you ever want to come to, with me, I'll show you the most beautiful part of our province. But I don't know if you've heard of something called tar sands or oil sands. That's where I come from. So it's the second largest deposit of oil in the world. It's the number one um, carbon dioxide polluter in our country. And it's a big issue in our country right now. So just wanted to put that out there for you. Secondly, this is where I live. Oops, let's just get it. Yeah, there. So this is my campus. It's, it's a fascinating, oops, a little too fast. Let's go back. Maybe I will stand up there just, just so I can see the slide. Get it. Yeah, there we go. We've got it. So I live in a beautiful part of Alberta. So this is my campus. But if you look towards the slide, that's the mountains, and it's fascinating. That's the second largest Indian or native reserve in our country. And Alberta is the wealthiest country, or wealthiest province in our country. But I'd say about 50% of the people that live just outside of the university do not have clean drinking water. So you may have think of Canada as being always a developed country, but we've got issues just like everybody else. So what I'd like to do, you've been sitting for a long time, um, and again, I just know Brazilians love to talk and love to share ideas. So could I ask you just for a minute, just introduce yourself to the person you're sitting beside and I'm going to try and get this, engagemento dos alunos. <laughs> this is how I always start my classes, because I know I may look a little old, but inside I'm always 19. But I know the students, the students, their, their concept of engagement, their concept of learning is much different than mine. So I always just turn this over to the students, and I'd like to turn it over to you. Could you please share with each other, what does engagement mean for you, either as a teacher or a student? So just a moment, please introduce yourself to the person beside you, and just what does engagement mean? I'd love, I'd love you just to share those ideas. Let's go, Team Brazil. And, and I'm sorry, I should know this. On the way in from the airport yesterday, people asked me, what's my favorite football or soccer team in Brazil? And I'm so sorry, I don't know. I just know you have an amazing national team. We have a crazy sport in Canada, ice hockey, and I could ask you the same thing about your favorite team. But this is, again, I think such an important concept. And Again, how important it is that we listen to our students and we understand what learning means to them. So I just want to share some, some ideas about this topic from people in North America. And this is one of my favorite people. Um, this is a fellow, Dennis Litke. He lives in a little cabin in upstate Maine, which is close to Canada. It is in the United States. And when the, um, Barack Obama was a, in the president, this, this, this young man, uh, was on his national advising committee for both terms. And what I like about Dennis, he keeps things simple. So when he talks about engagement, he talks how important it is that students can see themselves in their own learning. There's relevance. So in English, we talk about curiosity, that we want to know what are the students, what are the big questions, what are they curious about? But the others see how connected they are as well. So that's the first R. The second thing is rigor, and I know I've got a lot of game designers in the audience, and I think if you've ever designed an educational game before, how important challenge is. Also, a lot of you probably know that in terms of gaming, it's also the most powerful form of assessment because students are getting, every time they make a decision in a game, they're getting feedback. So we talk about a challenge. And in Canada, what we like to do is often push students outside of their comfort zone. There's a, a Swiss educational a psychologist who lived 
in the, a long time ago, did a lot of work in the 50s and the 60s, looking at his grandchildren, it was Jean Piaget, and he talked about accommodation and assimilation. We need to push people outside of their comfort zone, and the real learning takes place when they sort of reach equ equilibrium again. And last but not least, and this is why I really love to be in Brazil, is relationships. How important that sense of community is and how important we work, we collaborate together to really create a strong democratic society. And this is something that I'm really envious and jealous of you in Brazil. In Canada, we're divided by states, and especially with health care. We work inside our systems. We don't work across our country. So I want to give a shout out to you. Now, finally, I know how to pronounce this young man's name. It's Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. He visits at my university every four years. I was here in 2016. What a party you had for your Summer Olympics. It's been a long time ago for us. It was 1988 was the Winter Olympics in Calgary. And that still is the home of our training zone. So all our, our winter athletes, which we depend on, all go to my university. And Mihai comes every four years to work with the athletes. And he talks about being in the zone. And I think this is so special for our students and ourselves. When we have the sense of flow, just time doesn't exist anymore. We are so involved and so into what we're doing. Last but not least is an interesting fellow that I've got to know is Dan Pink. And Dan lives in Boston University. His children go to Dennis Litty's school, big picture. And he does extensive interviews with Mihai in this book. And he talks how important that learning is its autonomy, that students see themselves in the learning. This isn't something to do. I know we all have medical examinations and things like that. But it's the real internalization of learning. We also have a, 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 well, somewhat a famous Canadian author. His name's Malcolm Gladwell. He lives in New York City now, but he's written a lot of books. And one of the books he wrote was The Tipping Point. And whether you're the Beatles um, becoming uh, music or Neymar, some of your famous soccer players, it takes hours and hours to master something, to be a dentist, to be a doctor. And, and it's that sense of purpose. The reason that you're doing it is to really make a difference. So we've got the three of those, and what we did is with those three experts, we actually designed one of the few national studies we've done in Canada. It's our Canadian Educational Association, and I deal mainly with students in their primary and their secondary, so not at the tertiary level, primary and secondary, and we looked at 60,000 students across Canada. And what we are trying to do is get the dimensions of engagement. The first one was this idea of social engagement. Um, it could be the sports team, the debating team. Um, it, it could be they are involved in clubs. Academic engagement is you know, getting through those examinations, especially at the secondary level. And the third thing that we were really interested in is their sense of purpose, their sense of intellectual engagement. Why were they learning? What was their passion? What was turned them on? And I know this graph is going to be really difficult to see. My apologies, but you can get the slides, I'm sure, from me or from the conference. But what we were looking at at the X on the bottom axis is looking at children from grade 5 to graduation in high school in grade 12, and every curve goes down. And this was so discouraging for us. We were looking at students' sense of belonging, their participation in sports and clubs, attendance, their sense of intellectual engagement. And when we talked to students, they said, I feel like I'm doing this for someone else. I'm doing it for my parents. I'm doing it because I want a job. I'm not really doing it because I learn. So unfortunately, our education system, we need to do a lot of work. It's externalizing rather than internalizing the process of learning. So now we come to something that I've been really involved in, and my gosh, you know, blended learning means so many different things to different people. And again, I would really emphasize in your programs, in the health programs, making sure that you, you don't only have clear definitions, you have conversations, discussions, and debates with students so they're clear about what their roles and responsibilities. This can be a very powerful form of learning, but it can be a very <sighs> unproductive form as well. And I'm going to try and give you some of the positives. So what happened, this term really came out of the United States, at least the English version, and um, it's called the Online Learning Consortium in the States. It's been around, it's celebrating its 25th anniversary. And what they would do is every year, starting in 2003, 
they were trying to get a sense of what percentage of students, undergraduate students in the United States were participating in various forms of learning. And the thing that I disagreed with, it really wasn't about learning, it was how you were delivering content. So online meant that students were nowhere near you. They were in remote areas, rural areas, or they were in the campus um, dorms. They weren't coming. Face-to-face -face meant they were physically in front of you like you are today. And blended learning was a mix. And that really didn't mean a lot to me. I, I think learning is about the approaches, the ways we engage students, not where they're sitting in life. So what we did, we took a look. And, and again, I'm so excited to be here. I've learned that University of Sao Paulo is probably the largest university in Latin America. It is a real privilege to be here. So when we think of universities like the University of Sao Paulo, I think it started in the, the mid-30s. You go back, you look at some of the British, the European universities that started 10th or 11th century. We have this tradition of doing what you're doing, sitting in seats. But I know in Brazil, boy, the home of Paulo Freire, everything you've done, you have a really rich history of online learning that may not have taken place with the digital technologies, but students were learning at a distance. They were using the mail, things like that. And then what happened, I'd say in the 1990s, we had the advent of what we call learning management systems. And it's kind of fun. A lot of them actually come from Canada. Some of you may be old enough to remember something called WebCT that was developed at the University of British Columbia. We have Moodle now, Desire to Learn, Blackboard. But that, for me, was sort of the modern idea of blended learning, that we could now combine learning that was taking place, seating, sitting down face to face, but also that learning could take place when we weren't physically together. In the area of telehealth, you really have been the leaders. And our medical profession reminds me that we've had the telephone forever, that you really have doing online blended learning for a long time, where we were combining asynchronous, which means sort of offline email, with synchronous webinars, telephones, and things like that. One of the things we're really excited in Canada is our work with our native or indigenous people. Um, this is probably the largest growing sector of our population, is our indigenous population. And they're the ones that have been the most underserved, the ones where just education has not taken place because of the remote nature, um, the, the costs, uh, various factors. What we've tried to do now is we have 26 Indian reservations in my province. We have a learning center now on each of those reserves, but most of the learning takes place with experts or other people online using synchronous communication. So we're blending not only face-to-face, -face, but we're blending online as well. One of the things that I'd like to argue against is this idea of a flipped classroom. And I have to be careful, because these were a couple friends um, in Colorado. It's um, just due south of us, Denver, Colorado. A couple high school teachers came up with this term. The reason I don't like this term is it talks about not engaging students. And, and again, my apologies, I know you're very passive, you're sitting here, but when we think of lectures, we often think of people just sitting here and then they do homework. Whereas all they do with flipped classrooms is students are just watching videos. They're not engaged. And again, just talking to the few people so far, and again, I'm so excited to learn from you, how you're doing so much more. You've got the gaming. Um, I know we've got David Kaufman here tomorrow to talk about problem-based learning. But learning is like the Nike commercial, just do it. It's about being active all the time. There is going to be a time for passivity, but really it is all about learning. So what we did is, my gosh, where has time gone? It's already 10 years ago since we wrote this book. The two things that I still take away from this book is that we're dealing with humans, that it really is organic. You can have the de best plans, the best designs, but it's really about knowing your students. I teach three sections of the same course every semester, and it's three completely different groups of students. My outcomes and my objectives, my assessment, my assignments are similar, but our paths to get to the end of the course are completely different in all three because of the nature of the humans I have there. Last but not least, we're going to hear a lot about the importance of design, how important it is we have design. There's a lot of work being done, I know in Brazil, especially in California, San Francisco, around design-based thinking that we can talk about throughout the conference. So for me, 
the real opportunity as blended learning is I'm not limited anymore. I've got a lot of paints. I've got a huge canvas. I can choose what works best depending on whether it's a theoretical or a practical course in dentistry, uh, whether it's a clinical, um, maybe in a healthcare cost care, I can choose my approaches. What's going to work best? When do we need the synchronicity, the conversations, maybe using FaceTime, different webinars? When do we need to be reflective? We need the contemplation, the discussions, the alone time, working, having time to think and respond to each other. And again, I heard this in the opening session, how important is we integrate. It's not one or the other, but we integrate them together. So there's been a lot of research, a lot of work done in blended learning, especially when Obama was the president of the United States. I got to work with his administration a little bit, not him personally. But again, if it's done correctly, it can really help students in terms of making their learn more effective, making better use of their time, especially with uh, people coming back to school, adult populations who've got young families, parking issues, things like that. It can be much more efficient in terms of the way that we use campus resources, and it can have convenience in terms of where we're accessing our learning, 24 hours, seven days a week. It does come with challenges, and I really want to emphasize that we have had some significant challenges with blended learning in Canada. And the most significant challenge for us has been with our student population. Um, this is an outgrowth of the United States in terms of standardized testing. Our students have high stakes tests at the end of grade three, grade six, grade nine, and I think it's probably true in Brazil as well, coming out of high school. They're used to being taught for a test. They want to know, is this going to be on the test? It's a very external form of learning. This idea that they have to take more responsibility has been a huge issue. And again, there's always going to be technology issues, but the number one area that we've had to put money and support in is into student learning, helping students transition to a more active, a more responsible way of learning. And that has not been easy for our student population, especially at the undergraduate level. In terms of teachers, I'm so excited to have the four, pro just to see the people here supporting for you. That is the key to make sure that administrations support. We have a process in North America, it's called tenure. So in order for me to, to keep my job, there's a number of things I have to do. And I'll be honest, a lot of them, unfortunately, do not revolve around teaching. It's publications and it's research. It's how much money I'm bringing to the institution. It's my publications. So when it comes to teaching, I do not want to take a lot of risks. I want the students happy so that they'll give me good reports and I can get good feedback. So that's the challenge. The last thing, and it's a wonderful, again, to see the vision, and to see the vision that you have as a country as Brazil, is too often we go to conferences, we find new technologies, new approaches to learning, but we don't come up with a plan about how we're going to enact it. How are we going to reward people? How is there going to be collaborative leadership? How are we going to move from a vision to implementation? And finally, evaluation. How are we going to know if we make a difference? Okay. Moving along, back to you for a moment. I think I see, and it's, it's just wonderful. Um, I'm going to be careful here, but I see people a lot younger than me, which is exciting. Um, whether I like it or not, I'm getting close to the end of my career. So it's really exciting to see young people here. So I'm curious to hear from you specifically. So if you could just turn back to the people beside you. And with all these digital technologies, everything that we we're doing these days, I'm curious, what are some of the key roles? What are the main responsibilities for us as professora or professors in um, this wonderful country of Brazil? So back to you for just two minutes. Talk, talk, talk. What is it? What does it mean to be a teacher in the day and age with all these digital technologies? So back to you. Please share at least one idea with each other. Let's go. I'm sure there must be an amazing soccer game on this week or something. So we're, again, not the first to have those conversations. And it was a real privilege to me. And the next World Conference in Online Learning in two years is going to be held here in Brazil. And I'm so excited. I will be back here in two years ago. Four weeks ago, it was held in Ireland. 
And it was wonderful. All these, these men who are, have been my mentors were all there. Zane Burge from the United States, Morton Flat Polson, who just stepped down as uh, the president for the International Congress of Distance Education from Norway, uh, Bob Mason, and um, the four folks that I re- work very closely with, Terry Anderson, Liam Rourke, Rary, uh, Randy Garrison, and, and Walter Archer. And again, like you, they had a lot of ideas. And again, as researchers, we like to categorize things. And it's interesting, when they looked at the roles of teachers in what we called computer-mediated communications, the 90s were the time of online discussions. We were doing a lot online, the, the web. The internet had been around since the 60s. The web was just sort of taking off, but we were doing a lot of our online learning through online discussions. And they came up with this idea that we sort of had to have an organizational, there had to be a design, the organization. There had to be a social component um, to the learning. And most important was that there was an intellectual component. So what happens is three folks that I work with um, who are from the University of Alberta, which is just due north of where I come from, came up with this idea of called the Community of Inquiry Framework. And, and I don't want to go into the entire framework with you today, but one of the things that I took out, and I know that you're already doing here in Brazil, is this idea of teaching rather than teacher presence. So teaching is the idea is that everybody in the course, everybody in the class has something that they can teach each other and that we can learn from each other. And we came up with these three categories, this idea of how important it is to have a design, how important that there is a sense of organization, the course is going something somewhere, you're the captain of the ship. The facilitating discourse is really important. There's a phrase in English, and I'll try and say this slowly so it gets translated. We talk about being a guide on the side or a sage on the stage. And and I think in order to be a really, really good teacher, you have to know when it's time to be the sage, to be on the stage like I am now, and when it is to be a guide. And I think the most important thing for us is to model the type of learning that we want our students to have. And this is a real issue in Canada. We have a term in Canada, we call it pathological politeness. We don't like to disagree, we like to smile. You give us something called a hockey stick and we'll get really aggressive. But this is an issue for us, and especially in online learning where we can't see each other, is we've got to engage in constructive discourse. We've got to challenge each other's ideas. We've got to agree to disagree. And as teachers, we have to model that sort of discourse. Last but not least, we're the ones who have the content, the concept. We've got the wisdom. We've got something to share and impart. And that's what students are looking for. They're not looking for just online discussions and sharing with each other. They're looking for us to share and impart our wisdom with this. So what we did, and again, like any good academic, we wrote another book, um, just another edition's coming out. But we looked at what are some of the key principles of blended learning. And we came up with two design principles. We came up with two facilitation principles two direct instruction principles, and one that sort of makes sense, assessment has to align with the learning outcomes. And just in the interest of time, I won't take too much time, but I'd just like to go through some of the principles and the strategies that I've found have been really effective with these. So this goes back to my work with Dennis Litke in terms of relevance, and I think this is so important when we're starting a course, but especially when it's blended and online and we've got limited physical face-to-face contact is to do a needs assessment to really understand what the needs of the students are. What are the expertise? What are the misconceptions? What are they bringing to the course? The second thing that I think is so important is to help the student set goals. We all have curricular outcomes, program learning outcomes, but what are their personal goals? What is it they want to get out of this course? Help them establish those goals at the beginning of the course and then help them manage and monitor those goals as they go through those. So the first two principles are around communication, critical reflection, but in my mind it's really about establishing the relevance so that students can see why this course is important for their life and for their future profession. 
The next two principles, I would argue, are around relationships. And I, I think you probably do a better job in Brazil than we do. But our students have not learned how to work together. We assume that people know how to work in groups, but my experience suggests no. So again, what is new is old. There was an amazing man, I remember him working with my father. My father was a university professor as well. Bruce Tuckman, this is back in 1965, talked about the five stages of team development. Forming, storming, norming, performing and adjourning. And in my mind, those five stages still apply today. And what we need to do is provide students with the experience to go through all five stages so they really learn what it means to be collaborative. And especially when we're dealing with the health professions, we, we have to work in teams, we have to work successfully. My experience, and I'm going to be careful, with students coming into our health professions in Canada is they've done incredibly well on the entrance exams and they're very individualistic. We, we have very individualistic students who do not know how to work successfully together. So principle number three and four is really helping students to learn how to collaborate and work together. Principle five and six goes back to the sense of rigor. And I think it's all exciting for us. Um, some of you have children. In my case, I'm still waiting for that first grandchild. I know, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. But this sense of rigor, I think we're all excited when we overcome a problem. And it was just interesting in, in, in the introduction, hearing about everybody, how you've worked together to do collaborative problem solving. And I think this really is the key to problem-based learning, is that we learn how to collaboratively solve problems. But from my experience, this takes a lot of work on the part of the teacher. And there's a younger, young, an amazing young woman. She's not so young anymore. She's, boy, Cass is getting into her late 30s. She wrote a book in 2008, and she was the social media director for Obama um, for his first uh, campaign in 2008. Her name's Cass Sustein, and she wrote a book. It's called The Nudge Factor. So how do we positively push people forward out of their comfort zone? In our experience with blended and online courses, this is critical. In our experiences, students love to explore. They love to give opinions. They love to give ideas. But we've got to push them forward. OK, how are you integrating your learning? How are you applying it to your future profession? How are you solving problems? So that's our, our guideline number five and six is this sense of rigor. So just to finish up, I'm not doing too bad in time is um, I know you've got just a really rich culture and history of indigenous groups here. I'm fortunate, um, I guess it'd be our vice rector at our university is from New Zealand. So I get to travel to New Zealand quite regularly, which is a real privilege for me. And in New Zealand, it's the, 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 um, the original people were the Maori people, and it's fascinating. They don't have a word for teach, and they don't have a word to learn. Their word is ako. I teach to learn, and I learn through teaching. And they only have seven universities. And so it's really neat. They have a national framework where they, where they support each other, and it's called Ako Aotearoa. Just a couple more slides. There's one really interesting fellow that you may have heard of. I know he's done a lot of work with assessment in the health professions. His name's John Hattie. He's originally from New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand. He lives in Australia, the University of Melbourne. He's done a lot of work on this idea of making learning visible. And again, I think how important this is in the health professions is that we really make our learning visible for ourselves, for our patients, for our clients. And I love this phrase, and I'll say it slowly, when teachers see learning through the eyes of their students, we really remember what it's like to be a student. But more importantly, when students see themselves as their own teachers, they take responsible for their learning. They become your mentor. And with that, um, just I'd like to open it up to questions. And, and also, just a little plug for us. I, I heard it mentioned in the introduction. We have this community of inquiry research group. It's based at our univer open university, Athabasca University. Um, if, if you're ever interested in doing work with us, evaluation work or whatever, um, we'd love to do it. But I think I'm looking at the moderators. Do I poke a little time for questions? Simon's story, time's over. Okay. <laughs>
But, but if anybody does have a question, I think we have a few moments of questions. And if, if you want to do it in Portuguese as well, I'll turn this on. This is always the most difficult thing I find. Um, usually what you could do is maybe in those discussions about engagement or around roles and responsibilities, you, you heard your colleagues say something really interesting. So you could point to that person and maybe they could share something. So um, anybody, I know the first one's always so difficult, especially in a foreign area. Anyone at the back? <laughs> Everyone's looking down now. When uh, somebody's got to have one question. Go sorry, for it. Sorry, Professor Logan. Sorry for uh, the time is over. We are 15 minutes ahead. Okay. Um, uh, maybe is, can we uh, make available this PowerPoint for yes. everybody? Yes, we can yes. definitely. Okay, and that's that's one 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 result we have now. Um, may, uh, sorry, but we are out of time, and no, we no. can. Sorry, I have a suggestion. Yes, maybe we can have two or three uh, question that you ask about engagement and about success, and so they can expose what they think about, and you can discuss a little bit. It could be more profitable for us in that short time, maybe? Okay. A ideia é, ele pediu para vocês discutirem o engajamento e discutir também a, 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 as questões de sucesso, né? E vocês fizeram uma conversa entre pares. Eu estou sugerindo que dois ou três de vocês coloquem o que vocês discutiram sobre engajamento e depois ele discute e depois dois ou três sobre sucesso. Eu acho que pode ser mais proveitoso do que a gente fazer perguntas isoladas. Tudo bem? Acho que ele fez um processo participativo, que eu acho que esse feedback seria importante. Então, é, nós não vamos passar papelzinho de pergunta, desculpe, não vamos ter tempo. Eu queria, então, é, estimular dois ou três de vocês para dizer como é que vocês conceituaram ou definiram engagement. Alguém se habilita? É exercício, não tem prova. Nem nota. Quem topa? Eles não toparam. Não? Sorry, they are not willing to discuss engagement or success. And just, I am here for the entire two days, so if people would like to talk with me individually, that'd be wonderful. So thank you so much for your time, and again, just, if anybody... Oops. É, professor, a experiência que eu tive, é, eu sou Lucas, aluno de mestrado, e nós aqui na USP, nós temos um programa dentro da, da graduação que nós acompanhamos os professores. Eu tive a oportunidade é, de trabalhar com uma professora é, na, na fé que ela trabalha com estatística, que é uma disciplina que ela tem, uma, às vezes, uma dificuldade de, de linguagem com os alunos. E eu vejo é, outro aspecto também, que é o aspecto geracional. Hoje, os youtubers eles têm uma facilidade muito grande de, de comunicação. E, às vezes, os professores eles são de outra geração. Então, eles têm hábitos de comunicação que são diferentes dos alunos que estão entrando na, na faculdade. Eu gostaria de saber se o senhor tem é, uma, uma experiência é, como, assim, como a linguagem como antecessora do, do engajamento é, em sala de aula. Porque eu pude é, ter essa experiência que a professora ela conseguia realmente ter uma linguagem é, no, no nível dos alunos e uma linguagem é, muito próxima a deles. Ainda mais uma disciplina de estatística que muitas vezes é, é difícil de lecionar em, em sala de aula. Então, eu pude ver realmente que o engajamento deles é, era influenciado pela linguagem que o professor utilizava em sala de aula. Muito obrigado. Uh, we have Think, yeah, I'm on. You can hear. Yeah. The question is, I understand, it is about the language of engagement, and it's really interesting. You brought up the course of statistics because that's one of my sons. That's his area is statistics. And again, I think we do come from different generations, but I think what's really exciting is when we work at understanding the the perspectives 
from those different generations. And this is where I think it's important to get the students to tell their stories, not only us as professors. You mentioned the YouTube generation. What's been really exciting for me, and I will use statistics, is when students can tell their stories through digital video. And, and if you've ever worked with video, it can be a lot more work than doing an essay or a major sort of conventional research project around statistics. Storytelling, and we are talking about storytelling with the elders here, is a very complex thing to do. So just what I do, because I'll be honest, I have language issues as well. I, I know I want to be 19, I want to be Neymar, but I'm, I'm getting close to 60. So how important it is, especially at the beginning of the course, and it may, if I'm in a large area like this, I would do it online, getting them to do maybe a needs assessment survey about their experiences with statistics, their issues, but I think we can break the language barrier down, and I'll be selfish, I love to learn your language. That's why I teach to learn. So again, I think it's understanding. We need to understand where the students are coming from. Also, we're going to talk a lot about digital technologies the next two days. I'm going to be careful. As you, you saw, this is very basic technology PowerPoint. The students now, what they're doing with augmented reality, virtual reality, even young children. Google has Google Cardboard. You can make VR. Young children, five years old, can go out, take pictures, and make virtual reality tours. I need to learn from that. With statistics, though, some of the basic concepts are still the same. The language is different, how we're using it, and statistics. I can't think of anything more important in this day and age is statistics, because we're using what we call big data in terms of medical profession, whatever. We need to rely on the facts, and we have the data to predict trends. So I think statistics is really exciting, but we need to understand where the students are coming from. And again, it's not, we're not talking down from them, but we're using their tools and their language to enhance, to actually make it a richer experience. And with that, I think we should stop and get on to the next session. <laughs> okay, excellent. Abrogato, thank you. That was a good question.